Hello and welcome to lecture 22. We are going to continue talking about transistors and here's my plan for today. So far we've spent a few hours discussing the NPN bipolar junction transistor. And we looked at the, the current voltage characteristics of the device in detail and we saw it in practice in a few circuits and, and in particular we looked at two examples of how it could be used, for instance, to give you a differential voltage gain uh, or how it could enable the creation of, of a branch with a current that was independent of the resistance that you put in that branch. So it was essentially a current source whose value was determined by some other part of the circuit. And these are just two applications and I'm hoping that over the next uh, few lectures, we'll, we'll have the chance to look at quite a few more applications or examples. But what I'd like to do today is to extend the discussion beyond the scope of the, of the MPN BJT, and in fact, beyond the scope of the BJT, and also introduce the field effect transistor. Um, and I'm hoping that we could see the, the generality of at a very high level of the behavior of the transistor so that we could see that from a circuit level point of view, there are a lot of similarities in dealing with, with the BJT and the FET. And while there are some important differences, uh, conceptually and the way you, you approach design philosophy, there is a lot of similarities. And so I'd like to continue the discussion today by first doing a very quick review of the MPN BJT, then introduce the, uh, introducing the PNP BJT, and then introducing the MOSFET, both the N channel and the P channel. And then we'll sort of have all the tools that we need to be able to now play around and, and look at a bunch of other examples of circuits. Okay, that's the plan. Quick review of what is really critical to, uh, to constantly have, have in mind when dealing with transistors, and in this particular case, the uh, NPN BJT. Sorry. This is the device symbol. You have the base, emitter, and collector nodes or terminals. And this is the convention that's common for defining the directions of the currents, base, collector, and emitter currents. And crucially, this is what we want to keep in mind when we think about this device in terms of its current voltage characteristics. Most importantly, we think about it as a device where we are interested in seeing how the collector current, which you, you think of as an output current if you want, is determined by what's happening at the input of the device being the base or more specifically between the base and the emitter. So we want the collector current to be primarily determined by the base emitter voltage, which means then that we want the collector current, if we were to plot it as a function of the collector emitter voltage, we want it to be essentially constant. because it's supposed to be determined by the base emitter voltage. And so variations in the collector emitter voltage should not have a significant effect on it. Now, we saw that this is true not in the entire range of collector emitter voltages from minus infinity to plus infinity, but only as long as the collector emitter voltage 
is above what you would call a point of saturation. And that would be, let's say, somewhere here, around, around 0.4 volts. And as long as you were on the other side, you were in the active mode. Here, you would call it saturation. Now, the, this current itself, the collector current that you get in active mode, is controlled by a knob that's on the other side. That's the, ba the base emitter voltage. So if you had added a small voltage source here, called VBE, that's the knob that determines what the value of IC should be. So if you change VBE, you will change IC. But again, primarily you want it to be independent of VCE. And you, you would see a behavior like this. So regardless of what VCE is in the active mode, IC would be more or less constant, and its value determined by VBE. So this one corresponds to VBE1, and this one corresponds to VBE2. Where in this case, VBE2 is larger than VBE1. And correspondingly, IC2 is larger than IC1. OK, so And by the way, we also saw that there was a relationship between the collector current and the base current, which you could write like this. The collector current was a factor, a large factor beta, something of order 100, times the base current. From which it followed, then, that the emitter current is only slightly higher than the collector current. So in an example, you might have a, a collector current of, let's say, 1 milliamp and a base current of, say, 10 microamp. And then the emitter current would be 1.01 .01 milliamp. So very often, you could even use the approximation that the emitter and collector uh, current are almost the same. This is true in the active mode. Once you start getting into the saturation mode, the collector current does not go up with the base emitter voltage as much as you want. And the, there, there starts existing a significant difference between the emitter and collector current. This is actually a good question. This is something that. You know, so this is the cir same circuit that we drew last time. VBE and VCE are two independent voltages. Remember, this is a three-terminal device. So we said that for, for a complete description, you need to have at least two voltages. Because there are three voltage differences involved, VBE, VCB, and VCE. And you need to specify at least two of them. And of course, the third one you would know by KVL. But two. Two out of three can be controlled independently. And in this case, I'm saying I have that other voltage source that can allow me to sweep VCE without changing VBE. And of course, the change in VCE, if you keep VBE constant, then corresponds to a change in VCB also by KVL. Okay, so very good question. All right, this is one, one thing maybe that's uh, good to emphasize here, that if you really think about the physics of operation of this device, which hopefully we'll talk about a little bit next week, it's really the base emitter voltage that's determining uh, how things happen. 
you might say. But you can also take an equivalent view that it's the base current that's determining what happen, happens to the collector voltage. And that's what this diagram uh, or this, this, schema, uh, this, this graph also shows, that you can think of the different values of IC as corresponding to different values of VBE or to different values of IB. And there is this very simple relationship between IC and IB being beta. And this beta is large as long as you are in the active mode. Okay? Now, for the device to be in active or saturation modes, you have to have turned on the, the base emitter junction that we said is almost like a diode. So you have to, in practice, have given it a good you know, 0.7 volts or so. Um, and, and then is the point where, or there is the point where you start having a significant collector current. Obviously, this is a rich device, depending on which mode you are in. And you, know, you could have a variety of uh, important things in its behavior. But primarily, you can think of it as a current source. Because if you look from the, the right-hand side, you're here where, where the current is constant with respect to the voltage. And the value of the current source is controlled by another voltage at, at the other side of the circuit, VBE, or a current there. Depending on, on the circuit you are analyzing, you might take one view or the other. You immediately would notice also that you can turn off this current source, as we said, by setting VBE to a value less than 0.6 or 0.7 volts. For instance, if you set VBE equal to zero, there won't be a current. And therefore, you see the behavior of the device as a switch. The, out, the output side, or the right-hand side, the current there can be turned on and off by changing the voltage at the input. This is the essence, or, or a very important aspect of the essence of this device. Now, this is the NPN transistor. Let's very quickly look at the PMP bipolar junction transistor. And I say very quickly because there is very little that's new there. And here's the difference. Look at the MPN device. Look at that arrow and the polarity there. Here's the PMP device. It's like a what? VBE. Yeah. If we keep decreasing VBE, now imagine I, I choose a VBE that's less than VBE1. Then the behavior will, will be like this. And if I choose a smaller one, like this. And smaller one, like this. And eventually, on the axis. OK? Was that the question? Yeah. And that's the cutoff, when the current becomes 0, regardless of what you have on the, on the VCE voltage. Right? Because once you reach this point, it's a current source with a 0 current. That's, this is a very good question we have here. What is the relationship in that saturation? Is that linear? or not. And as you can see, I've drawn it slightly curved. It's not a straight line hitting that point 4, because that's also not a, a, a very precisely defined point. I don't want to get too much into this, because it could create confusion. But I'll say a few words about it. And this is really how you can think about it. Again, it will make sense, more sense, hopefully, when we talk about the physics. Okay, But remember how I said this is well, an NPN structure, so you have two junctions. In active mode, your base emitter junction is forward biased, 
for the base emitter diode is forward biased, but the base collector diode is reverse biased. That's what we talked about last time. In saturation mode, consider the fact that when VCE starts becoming very small, it means the collector voltage has actually gone below the base voltage. So the collector base diode also starts becoming forward biased. And it will start injecting a diode current, which will then be subtracted from the, the other diode current. So you can think of it almost as two exponential uh, currents canceling each other out gradually. So it's not a single exponential, and it's not linear. It's a little more complicated than that. The, the, and, and we are talking about the details of, of the curve in the saturation mode. That's an important uh, question, an important feature. And in particular, if you were concerned with quantitative um, behavior in the saturation mode, you would want to have a good model for it. Uh, but it's the kind of thing that I would consider secondary, so I don't want to get, to, to, to get into the detail too much at this point. I think it's more important to to conceptually internalize this, this behavior. And then we'll see how far we can get next week. The PMP device, what do you guys think the difference is between the PMP and the MPN, as far as circuit level behavior is concerned? The only difference is the polarities are reversed. And the arrow there um, gives you a clue as to the direction of things. Because you see how the other one had the arrow pointing outward from base to emitter? In this one, the arrow is pointing from emitter to base. And in keeping with the direction of the currents, in the MPN device, I've also drawn this in, in such a way that the directions of the currents are downward. That's why I've put the, the emitter on top and the, base, uh, and the collector at the bottom. Here you have the emitter current. Here you have the collector current. And here you have the base current. And the device has a like we said, a PNP structure. Schematically, base, emitter, collector. Now, for this device to start conducting uh, having a current at the, uh, in the collector, you need to, again, forward bias the emitter base diode, like in the previous device. It just so happens that the diode is, is in the other direction. So you need not a VBE equal 0.7 volts, but you need a VEB equal 0.7 volts. This is the voltage source that you would need here. V, E, B. And the output voltage that you're concerned about, if you want to have a positive number, you talk about the VEC rather than the VCE. And you see that the base current is going out of the base. Again, if you want a positive, if you want these currents not to have to carry a negative sign next to them, the direction is the way I've indicated here, as opposed to the one I had on top, uh, uh, at, at the top there for the NPN device. You have perfect duality here in terms of how the polarities are. There you had a positive VCE that was substantially greater than 0.4 volts to be in active mode. Here you have a VEC that has to be 
greater than 0.4 volts to be in active mode. The collector current is still beta times the base current. Of course, beta is a parameter that depends on the device. The collector current and the emitter current are very close, related, related by a factor alpha that could be 0.99 when you are in the active mode. You have your KCL, IE equals IB plus IC. You have your KVL, VEC equals VEB plus VBC. Still, you need two voltages, two independent voltages to completely define uh, all the uh, node voltages in the device. Um, everything else from a circuit level point of view, again, is the same. So if you wanted to plot the, uh, the IV characteristics in terms of the collector current, versus the output voltage, well, it's the same curve as before. It's just that you are dealing with VEC. If, if you want, you can work with VCE, but then it will be a negative number. So you have to plot this on the other side. And normally, one doesn't like that, unnecessarily introducing negative numbers. So same behavior. And this would be for two different values of VEB, and this would be approximately 0.4 volts. This would be for VEB1, and this would be for V. EB2 rather than VBE. And for the device to be in active mode, you need VBE to be approximately 0.6 or 0.7 or a little higher for, for the emitter based diode to be on, and VEC to be more than give or take 0.4 volts. And of course, again, you can say that. The collector current here, if you call this IC1, is beta times IB1. And if this is IC2, this is beta times IB2. Having this device that is complementary to the other one, if you want, in terms of the, the polarities, uh, gives you a lot of freedom in designing circuits. Okay. But in terms of approach, analysis, um, making circuits with this, for instance, making a current mirror with this, as opposed to the MPN, it's just the, the dual of the circuit. And we will see some examples of this. Especially we have uh, the tutorial tomorrow, so we'll be able to do more examples. Okay. But as far as circuit level behavior is concerned, it's just the polarities. Like I said, I'd like to um, increase the size of our toolbox. So I want to now also introduce the other transistor, the field, uh, the field effect transistor. And then we will have uh, time to look at more circuit level uh, types of behavior. Anything you guys would like to reiterate here, emphasize, be it on NPN or PMP? Again, let's remember this is active. This is saturation. Now I'd like to introduce the field effect transistor. And in particular, the metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor. <coughs> 
the MOSFET, metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor. Pretty long name. But it deserves it because it's the workhorse of modern day technologies. This is what you find in, in great numbers. By great, I mean by you know, in tens of billions in your pockets. Like the BJT, it has two different types. One is called the N-channel MOSFET. The other one is called the P-channel MOSFET. Now let me start by introducing the N-channel MOSFET. And the N and P here are, are the same N and P in the, in, the, in the BJT. They refer to a semiconducting material, primarily silicon, uh, being uh, doped with impurities that make it of either n-type or p-type. Anyway, n-channel MOSFET, or you might say n-MOS, and it looks like this. This is a somewhat of a simplified, simplified circuit level view. It's a three-terminal device. Make this a little bigger. Very much similar to the BJT, it has the output side, if you want. Instead of emitter and collector, the uh, the, the two terminals here are called source. And drain. Now we had a brief chat about what emitter meant in the BJT. Do you guys remember what we said the emitter emitted? What it is that the emitter, uh, what is it that the emitter emits? Electrons. What do you think it, it, uh, is it that the source sources here? It's the source of what? Electrons. Source of electrons, emitter of electrons. OK, same thing. The collector there collected the electrons that were emitted by the emitter. Here, the drain is is the point where the electrons that the source has sent out get drained or get collected. If you want. Same thing. There, the base, the base voltage allowed you to control the, the current that was collected at, at the collector. Here, you call it gate. What controls things, you call it a gate rather than a base. Let me be consistent here. The yes. What is the field effect? And that's a very good question. And again, I defer this primarily to when we discuss the physics a little bit. OK? But here is the, f the, the essence of the field effect. You notice something uh, other than the fact that the lines are straight here. You notice a difference on this schematic with the BJT. And that's the fact that the gate is, it, it, it seems like it's not directly connected to the other line. There's a gap there, right? That gap is representing a capacitor, essentially, OK? Now remember, in a capacitor, when you apply a voltage between the two sides, you have, you essentially create a field. Uh, and you have, you, you manage to bring charge to the two sides of the capacitor. So one, one side ends up being positively charged and the other side negatively charged. And there is a field between the two plates corresponding to the voltage difference. The field effect is emphasizing this. The fact that by applying a voltage to that gate electrode, you are applying a voltage essentially to a capacitor, 
and therefore creating a field across that capacitor that attracts your charged particles, in this case the electrons, to create a channel there. And the electron density in that channel is controlled by the effect of that field applied through the gate voltage. And, and in fact, there, there are great conceptual similarities between the two devices, between this and, and the BJT. Now, there are very, very important differences. Don't get me wrong. But, um, but it's very useful to talk about them in, in, uh, in parallel, if you want. And we'll get there when we talk about the physics. Now, let's talk about the source and drain and and gate currents. Let's also remember that to, to fully specify things here, we need at least two, well, we need two independent voltages. Call this VGS. And VDS. Now, a question for you guys. What is, what is the gate current in this device? Zero. 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 It's a capacity. Well, is it always zero? No. What's the condition for it to be zero? When is the current in a capacitor zero? When it's fully charged, when things are not changing anymore, right? When you are in DC steady state. In DC steady state, if you're uh, analyzing the DC steady state behavior of this device, there is no change with time. So IG, which would be some capacitance times D, VGS by DT, that current is zero. That makes things uh, immediately simpler, right? And in fact, circuit designers like that. If IG is zero, what is the relationship between ID and IS? In the BJT, even in DC steady state, there was a small base current. The collector and emitter currents were approximately equal. In the MOSFET, in DC steady state, the, uh, the, the drain and source currents are the same. The base current is zero. You also have your KVL, like before. that determines the third voltage um, that you have not specified. So this tells you that VDS equals VDG plus VGS. If I have specified VGS and VDS using two independent knobs, two independent voltage sources, then VDG is also well defined. Oh, you're right, absolutely, thank you. Sorry about that. Certainly the way I have indicated IG. Now it turns out to be zero, so, but, but you're right, absolutely. That was a mistake. Now to the behavior of this device, other than, of course, the application of circuit laws to it, KVL and KCL, the behavior of this device. I'll tell you how this device behaves, and then you guys tell me if this sounds familiar. The drain current in this device, or you might say the output current on the right-hand side, is controlled by the voltage, but, but primarily, or in the desired mode of operation, which we'll get to, controlled primarily by the voltage applied at the input between gate and source. The output current controlled by the input voltage. Does that sound familiar? 
sounds like the BJT, right? It is at that level, OK? Quick exercise for you. Try to guess what the current voltage characteristics of this device look like. If I were interested to plot as a function of output voltage, VDS, if I were interested to plot the drain current, what would this curve look like? See if you can guess. <coughs> I'm sure many of you guessed it right. Looks like that. Constant current, uh, current regardless of that output voltage VDS, acting essentially as a current source, whose value is considered, uh, is, is, uh, is determined or controlled by a voltage at the input. Let's say this is for VGS1. Now for a different value of VGS, It would be like that. And it turns out the more you increase the VGS voltage, the more the drain current will increase. And in, in a big chunk of the characteristics, that value to first degree does not depend on VDS. How do you think things change as I reduce VDS below a certain amount? like that. Now one immediate difference you notice, here we do not have the equivalent of ID equal or, or IC equal beta IB that we had there. Because if you wanted a relationship between ID and IG, well IG is zero. So the constant of proportionality would have to be infinity. It's not a useful thing. So we determine ID only directly with VGS rather than with IG. And again, remember, we are talking about DC steady state. In this case, VGS2 is greater than VGS1. What should I call this, this part of the characteristics? Yeah, it's, this is one of those places where people have intended uh, for confusion to happen. Instead of calling this part active, we call it saturation. And you might say this is more intuitive because you see directly the current saturate there, right, as a function of voltage. This region, now, see this region, I don't want to, to call it, uh, to, to draw an arrow here really. Because the boundary, as opposed to being uh, something around 0.4 volts, regardless of VGS, the boundary here itself changes with VGS. You see I've uh, drawn a, a curved boundary. So maybe it's better to kind of uh, shade this region. And this is called the triode region. or mode. All right, to a large degree, this is it. This device is behaving in, in many ways similar to the other device. In fact, from a, a very high level point of view, circuit level point of view, uh, the most important aspects look very similar. Now remember, last time we said that the, uh, in, in, in the BJT, in active mode, 
the curve was not entirely flat. It did have a small slope, and it ended up intersecting the VCE axis somewhere on the negative side. And we call that the early effect. And that represented a more realistic view of, of this device. Now, for many applications, assuming that it's, it's a perfectly flat, independent uh, of VCE type of current, um, is, is valid, at least qualitatively. But as I said last time, if you wanted to model that early effect, it would mean that your output is not just a controlled current source, it's a controlled current source with a resistor in parallel with it. And that would lead to an increase in the current as you increase the voltage across that output node. You do have a similar effect here. So there is also the early effect here. I won't bother drawing it. I'll just put a statement here that um, there is the equivalent of the early effect here also. Maybe it's good to put a reminder there. Again. But you do have that here also. Now let me be a little more quant quantitative. What I'd like to do next is to show you the relationship, the formula that relates ID and VGS and VDS. And this is how it works. For this device to turn on, to not be in cutoff, Things are, things are a little different from the BJT, and this is where we start seeing the differences. In the BJT, you needed to forward bias the base emitter junction. So you needed 0.6 volts, 0.7 volts there. Here, for VGS, it's not a 0.6 or 0.7 volt diode voltage. And it depends on the specific transistor you're using. It's something that will be given, you, given to you by the manufacturer. It depends on the device, uh, the, the details of the device. And it's called a threshold voltage. For this device to be on, VGS has to be greater than a certain threshold voltage. Its value depends on the device. And it's given in the data sheet. It could be 1 volt, 2 volts, 1.8 volts. Depends on the device. Now, once you have a VGS that's greater than VT, this is the current voltage characteristics of this device. What are all of these? VGS and VDS are the two voltages that control the device. VT is the threshold voltage, which we said is a device parameter. W over L, mu, C oxide are all device parameters. And they have to do with the structure and, and properties of the materials in this, in this device. I will again just tell you what they're called and then hopefully, when we talk a little bit about physics, they will, they will have some meaning. But as far as we are concerned at this point, this is all just a number, OK? Some device constant, again, a device parameter. Let me just write down the names for future reference. W is the device width. L is the channel length. Let me, let me say explicitly channel length. 
Mu is a parameter, is a material parameter that's called mobility. And C, C sub ox is a capacitance. It's actually a capacitance per unit area. And ox stands for oxide. These are again all values that will come from the device itself. Once you know the material, the, the doping densities, and the structure, you know these things. And then you, you, if, if you derive the equation that governs this device, you will see that these things will show up lumped in this way. Okay. Now, if you, if you look here, when I talk about the oxide capacitance, this is the capacitor I'm referring to, that capacitor at the, at the gate. Thinking about the acronym or, or the, the device description, metal oxide semiconductor, uh, this refers to the structure of that capacitance. You have a metal on one side, and, and strictly speaking, it may not be a metal, but it would be a, a highly conductive material. The dielectric that separates the two sides of the capacitor, you know, you could have a dielectric inside the capacitor, it doesn't have to be a vacuum gap. That dielectric, is made out of oxide, commonly silicon oxide, but these days it could be other things. Anyone heard of high, high K materials, high K dielectrics? Has anyone heard of the usage of things like hafnium oxide? Anyway, if you haven't, that's, that's fine. But anyway, there is, there is a dielectric there, and historically or traditionally it was silicon oxide, which is a very good dielectric. And then the other side of the capacitor is it's not a metal, it's the semiconducting material, and that's, that's where uh, you have the channel through which the electrons form. So that's the, the, uh, the, the capacitor formed around that oxide, and this is its capacitance per unit area for that particular process, for that particular technology. Mu is the mobility, and it refers to how the electrons or the, charged, uh, the charge carriers in the material respond to the electric field. The higher the mobility, if you want, the, the more current you will get when you apply a certain electric field in the device. W and L are structural parameters, and in particular, this channel length is interesting because if you refer to a technology node, if you say, I have a computer that's from a very long time ago, and it used, I don't know, a, you know, 0.1 micron technology, that was the length of the channel of the transistors. If you have a 7 nanometer technology node, that's the length of the channel of your transistor. That's essentially a, a, an indication of the distance between the drain and source. That's the channel length. So you have a pretty simple equation. If VGS greater than VT, this is some constant multiplying VGS minus VT, what their value is. And then you have a dependence, a linear, and then a, a, a square or quadratic dependence on VDS. And that is the triode region. So the way the current rises with VDS is like this. Conversely, if you keep VDS constant here, what is the behavior with VGS in the triode region? It's linear, right? Of course, shifted linear, because if you keep VDS constant, here you have a bunch of constants, the form in which VGS appears is just VGS minus that threshold, and then a bunch of constants. This is the device behavior in triode mode. So we had, for the device to turn on, you needed VGS greater than VT. In the triode mode, 
you have this behavior. And this is as long as VDS hasn't grown too much. So if you, you start with the VDS around here and increase VDS, you see that gradually you will at some point exit the triode region and enter the saturation region. And this is what determines the limit of VDS. If you keep increasing VDS so that you go beyond VGS minus VT, then something changes in the device. And in fact, that change is going from the triode to the saturation mode. So that, that dashed curve that determines or delineates the boundary between triode and saturation is determined by this, v VDS equal VGS minus VT. That's the boundary. And as I said before, you can see now that the boundary is not a fixed VDS of around 0.4 volts. It actually depends on the value of VGS. Now, what is the value of ID at this boundary? I'll just put VDS equal VGS minus VT. Let's see what we get. Instead of VDS, I'll, I'll put its value at that point. VDS is VGS minus VT. And again, I have minus half of VDS squared. I'll put that there. The rest is algebra. For a given value of VGS, this is what you have at the boundary. This dashed curved line on the characteristics, the boundary between uh, triode and saturation regimes. Now what happens beyond this point? The device is in saturation mode. The current stays saturated at this value. So this is for VDS being greater than VGS minus VT. The device current stays saturated. At, at, that, at what you have there. In other words, as long, if, if you don't think about the early effect, which is a secondary effect, you might say, the device current does not change, does not depend on VDS uh, 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 in uh, two, first, two first order. This is 
of course, an approximation. that neglects the early effect. To summarize this behavior, this is, this is best seen on this curve. Let's first start with the diagram. Let's say you have applied a given uh, VGS to this device. If that VGS is smaller than VT, that threshold voltage, this device is off. There is no current in the collector. The collector current is zero regardless of VDS. If you increase VDS to a point that it is beyond the threshold voltage, so let's say if your threshold voltage was one volt, your VGS is now 1.8 volts. You have that excess. Now you have a device that can turn on, and it has a, a channel uh, made of electrons that, it, uh, that allows it to conduct. And there you have this behavior. Let's look at the curve for VGS1, for instance. And, and we should emphasize again that this is greater than VT, the threshold voltage. Then if you start increasing VDS from 0, initially, you are here. The VDS value is small. Uh, sorry, you're here. And you have this curve, where ID is very sensitive to both VGS and VDS. And you can see that that's, that's how things rise. ID actually changes as a function of VDS as you increase VDS in this range. For a given VG VGS, if VDS reaches the point VGS minus VT, which is on this curve, on this dashed line. At that point, the value of the current has reached this. Because I just simply put VDS equals VGS minus VT in the formula. Beyond that point, if you keep increasing VDS, the current stays to first first order, it stays at that value. It will not change, neglecting the early effect. And that's what you see on the graph. That from that point on, you have reached the saturation mode, and the current will uh, stay more or less saturated. OK? This is the essence of the operation of the MOSFET, the N-channel MOSFET. Let's take a short break, and then we'll talk about the P-channel MOSFET. And in the meantime, guess what the behavior will look like. All right, I think maybe we should start. Again, I'm, I'm counting on the fact here. I'm counting on the fact that we already saw the operation of the BJT in a few circuit examples. So we have already seen what the effect of such IV characteristics, this kind of uh, circuit level behavior, is when you combine it with, with resistors to create amplification or, in another example, a current source. So we have some degree of familiarity with how such a device would operate in a circuit. And that's why I'm kind of taking the freedom to just introduce these other things now without, uh, without immediately doing examples so that we finish with this and then do examples on on all of them more and more. Because the, the current voltage characteristics look very much the same, albeit with differences in, in terms of the detail. Because as you can see here, the dependence of ID, uh, for instance, in this, in this saturation mode, which is in this case very often the desired mode of operation, ID is not an exponential function of the input, but it's a square function, a quadratic function of the input voltage, VGS. Let's also uh, write this down here, that the saturation mode is very often the desired mode of operation, like the active mode of the BJT. To complete this discussion, then, let's introduce the P-channel MOSFET. <coughs> 
a very similar device with polarities reversed. You have the gate here. The source here and the drain here. Have the source current, gate current, drain current. And you just have to be mindful of the polarities. For the device to turn on, VSG, VSG is a positive value. It has to be greater than some threshold. And because v, v threshold might be defined as a negative number, just to be sure, we put the absolute value here. In triode, VSD is greater than 0, and it's less than VSG minus the magnitude of the threshold voltage. And the current is, the drain current is Please verify that I'm writing this correctly, like the other equation. In saturation, what happens is when VSD is greater than VSG minus V threshold, And the current saturates to the value that you reach at the boundary, which is where you put VSD equal to VSG minus VT, absolute value of VT square. Okay. Please verify that I wrote these correctly, that they look like what we had for the other device with polarities reversed. And your IV characteristics would then look like this. You have ID, VSD, and you have the triode behavior until you reach saturation. And this is your boundary. And of course, you still have an early effect, but often you might neglect it. <coughs> and this would be for VSG1, and this would be for VSG2, where VSG2 is greater than VSG1. You see, VSG, the way I have defined the polarities, VSG is positive. A and again, <coughs> to be complete, I'll also show this voltage source here. This is the VSD. So in this particular case, VSG2 is greater than VSG1, which itself is greater than 
the value of the threshold, the, the ma uh, absolute value of the threshold voltage so the device is on. Same things that we talked about before. That's why I don't want to spend too much time on. But again, having this complementarity in terms of the polarities will allow you to do many, many things. And in fact, I'm sure everyone has heard of CMOS. CMOS means complementary MOS circuits, where the N-channel and P-channel uh, devices are both used. Okay. This is really at the level of the basics of the device characteristics. So it's like we've introduced the equivalent of Ohm's law. For the resistor, it took us a couple of minutes to say, well, V equals Ri, that was a simple relationship. Here, it took us more. And, and I hope that you are not bothered too much by the fact that we haven't really described the physics of this device yet, because when we talked about the resistor, we also didn't discuss the, the physics of the resistor. V equals Ri is something that we have taken, you know, gotten used to because we've heard it for a long time. It's not trivial at all. There is a lot of physics that goes into V equals Ri. And one could spend many, many hours talking about it, okay? But there we accepted that we'll look at that component only from outside the device, what it looks like in a circuit. We've done the same thing here. It's just that you have three terminals which makes it that you have two voltages and two currents, indep two independent voltages and two independent currents that are of course, of course related by KVL and KCL respectively. And that you also had nonlinear behavior, exponential or quadratic. But it's really the element relationship that we've introduced. So I'd like to ask you guys to, to take a moment to just kind of hopefully get a little more used to this, look at it a little bit, go through this curve on your own, take a deep breath, and then we will go back to discussing now how to use this element in a circuit. Also feel free, of course, to ask questions. Really, just a, a two-minute review of everything we talked about so far from the beginning. If you can go through it on your own for two minutes, it would be very helpful. Oh, very good question, thank you. Let's look at this or the other device. Let's start with the other one. The question is, if I look at the first equation in, in triode, okay, here. When I reach the point where, um, at the end of triode, where it's v, VDS becomes VGS minus VT. So the point we've talked about here. And I put that here and I get this value. Beyond this point, if I put a, VG, uh, sorry, a VDS that's greater than VGS minus VT, then if I keep increasing VDS, shouldn't this negative term, term keep increasing quadratically while this positive term is increasing only linearly? And so shouldn't I then start gradually go down, going down in current and eventually go, uh, go to negative currents and keep going? And the answer is, if this equation kept being valid, it's not anymore. The, once you reach the end of the triode region, this equation ceases, ceases to be valid. You reach that point where at the end of the triode region is this. And then something happens in, in the device physically for which the current will no longer follow that original equation. It will stay at this constant. This is not something that you can conclude from the equation. This is from the physics of the device, okay? That's why we've said beyond this, the device current stays saturated and the, the triode equation will, will ceases to be valid. It's the, the value will stay at whatever it reached at that point, okay? This, this comes from the physics of the device like the, the equation itself that came from the physics. And obviously you have the same story here. In the remaining time that we have today, I'd like to start that next phase at, uh, that, that I said we will just now talk about more circuit level concepts using these devices. And 
I will allow myself the freedom to go back and forth using BJTs or uh, MOSFETs, MPN, PMP, N channel, and P channel. And, uh, and that, that requires, again, that you guys please review these to be familiar with all of them. Let's do an example. Let's start with something extremely basic. Let's consider this. I use an N-channel MOSFET here. I ground this side. I connect this side to some input voltage. I put a resistor here. I connect this to VCC. Let's say VCC is 10 volts. Let's do something with numbers. And this is 1 kilo ohm. So you have the gate, source, and drain. For this device, I give you things from this, uh, the data sheets. For the N-channel MOSFET, for this particular N-channel MOSFET, the threshold voltage is 1 volt. And that parameter, W over L mu C aux, is, let's say that's, that's also 1. What should the unit be for that, by the way? 1 what? What's the dimension of that quantity? Now, I see many people are trying to do length over length time mobility times capacitance and, and per unit area. That's great. Um, we haven't really talked about the dimension of mobility. There's a shortcut way. Look at the equation for the current, where this appears. Amps per volt squared. That's the dimension, right? Because this multiplied by some voltage squared should give you a current. And in this case, let's say for this device, this is 1 milliamp per volt squared. OK? Let's call this node voltage V out. Plot V out as a function of V in. Think about it for a couple of minutes, and then we'll talk about it. Basically, I'd like to have a, a graph V out versus V in, starting from V in equals 0. Well, first of all, qualitatively, or you know, uh, based on a field that you have hopefully developed from what we saw in BJTs, because we looked at circuits that looked very much like this using BJTs, right? Remember the, the, uh, the common emitter amplifier. And this was the simplest case where you didn't have a resistor in the emitter uh, uh, node. It was just directly connected to, to the ground. In this case, you have, instead of a BJT, a MOSFET. Now, there, the device had, or the output versus input, With the BJT, you might recall it kind of looked like something like this. Okay, and that was a consequence of the fact that as you increase the input voltage, initially not much happened until the base emitter diode reached a, a point of about 0.7 volts, give or take, and then you started having a collector current there, which led to the output voltage going down from the VCC gradually because the output voltage is VCC minus that resistor R times the, the current in that branch. Well, qualitatively, you would expect something very similar here, because as you increase V in, initially not much happens. And then eventually, you have a, a drain current that will, that will lead to V out gradually 
descending. Qualitatively, very similar. The detail of the shape, of course, will depend because the IV characteristics of the two quantitatively are different, right? The, the equations are different. Starting from zero. If Vn is zero, what are these currents? Let's call this the drain current and this the source current. And again, we are concerned with DC behavior here. No change in time, so the gate current in this case is zero in DC behavior. If Vn is zero, what is Id? What is ID? Which mode are we in? If V in is zero, well, just scroll up, go back to your notes, see. Go back up to the characteristics. For this device to turn on, VGS has to be greater than a certain threshold voltage, right? Before that, the device is not on. The current is off. The, the current is zero. The device is off. Okay? That ID is off. V in here is your VGS. V in equals zero. means VGS is equal zero, and that is less than the threshold voltage, less than VT, which is one volt. Device is not on yet. Device is off. Meaning ID equals zero, which means then that the output uh, voltage V out is 10 volts minus one kilo ohm times zero, that ID, which is 10 volts. As long as VGS is less than VT, this is going to be true. Now, mind you, this is, uh, again, we are showing a device model that's approximate and simplified. Uh, things in nature are not so abrupt that there is absolutely no current until the point uh, that VGS becomes equal to VT, and then beyond that there is current. In practice, there could be a very, very small current even before uh, you reach VT, but that would be very, very small and for a, depending on the application, completely negligible. Now, these things could become very important if you're trying to push the boundaries, right? So if you're trying to pack more devices, make smaller and smaller devices, great, get greater functionalities. So if you are Intel and AMD going neck to neck, these things do matter. Yeah, they do matter greatly. Okay. But for now, they don't matter that much to us. And this, this behavior continues for all VGS less than VT. When VGS reaches VT, Vn, which is VGS, becomes one volt. And in fact, greater than one volt, beyond that, the device turns on. And the output current, this is very important, the output current then becomes that formula that we had, WL, 
mu times uh, C ox, which is one milliampere volt square. times Vgs minus Vt, which is Vn minus 1 times Vds. Now, what is Vds? Vds here is simply V out, if you look at that circuit. Minus half of V out squared. And this is true for, is there, is there a condition? Is there a condition on V out here? Or is this true for any value beyond this point? Is this true for all values of V out beyond this point? Well, let's go back. We had the device in the triode mode, and that was the equation. And that was applicable as long as VDS hadn't reached VGS minus VT yet. And that's when the point when the device switches from the uh, triode over to the saturation mode. So this is val uh, valid as long as you're in triode, which is VDS is greater than 0 but less than VGS minus VT. Now, VDS in this case is V out, same thing. So that's V out is greater than 0 and less than VGS, which is V in, minus VT, which is 1 volt for this device. See the threshold voltage? We have uh, taken it from the data sheet. That's 1 volt. So this equation will be valid for as long as V out is in that range. Is this correct? Here's a hint. As I keep increasing V in, does V out keep increasing or decreasing? When I increase V in, does V out go up or down? It goes down, right? So your V DS is actually going down. It's starting from a high value. Initially, it's actually 10 volts, right, because you have no current there. So V out is 10 volts. V DS is 10 volts. As I keep increasing V in, V out it, or V DS is a large value. It will keep going down. So as I as I start having a current initially, am I in the triode mode or in the saturation mode? Where am I on this, on this graph? Do I start from VDS being around 0 or VDS being a large value? A large value, right? So in fact, I'm starting from the saturation mode. As I keep increasing Vn, V out will keep going down. VDS will keep going down until I reach the triode mode. So this is, now you tell me, is this correct? Well, I mean, this is valid for the triode region, right? But it's not the step we want. Because when the device first turns on, we are not in triode. We are in saturation, which, which is the equivalent of the active mode for the BGT. We are in in that flat region, OK? As we are, if, so if the device turns on, yes, this is true if we are in triode and uh, not true if we are in saturation. Now, there's no, uh, there's no time axis here. Of course, you can solve for the triode region first and then the saturation. OK, so this, this in itself is not wrong, but in terms of the order of things that happen if you I start increasing Vn, this is not the first thing that you encounter. Okay, and that's, that's why I don't like it first. Otherwise, the equation itself, of course, you know, in, in triode, if you have that condition, the equation is correct. So 
this is now the point where I would like to ask you guys to go home and continue solving this example. So take it from here and try to do it before tomorrow. Because uh, tomorrow in the tutorial, we want to do a bunch of other examples. And this would help uh, sort of getting you in the right mindset. OK, thank you. <laughs>